समाज अपनी भाषा में ही आता है कंटेंट आपकी भाषा में ओनली ऑन डेली हंट हमें पता है आपको क्या चाहिए अपनी पसंद का कंटेंट ओनली ऑन डेली हंट रखो अपने एरिया की खबर लोकल अपडेट्स ओनली ऑन डेली हंट वी डिलाइट टू वेलकम यू टू द फोर्टीन जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल प्रोटेक्टेड बाय डेट ऑल इट इज आर प्लेजर टू प्रेजेंट Age of Disquiet, Reclaiming Hope, Sonali Gupta, Kerevi Bharatram, and Arshya Gaur, in conversation with Shilja Sen. We live in an age of accelerated anxiety, and the prospect of loss stares us in the face in the times of the pandemic. A conversation across generations, where two young women writers, Kerevi Bharatram, age twenty-two, and Arshya Gaur, age sixteen. share their fears and the process of healing with clinical psychologist and author sonali gupta and psychologist and family therapist shelaja sen sonali gupta is one of india's leading clinical psychologists with 16 years of experience sonali's new book anxiety overcome it and live without fear was released in 2020 She writes a fortnightly column for Mint Lounge titled "Heart of the Matter," which focuses on love, intimacy, understanding emotions, and mental health at large. She has been the official consulting psychologist for Tinder India since January 2018. Kairavi Bharatram graduated from the Sri Ram College in 2016. is currently studying fashion management at the London College of Fashion. Co-author of Ramayan and Krishna in Rhyme, and is an advocate for mental health, having suffered from depression for many years, and wrote this book with the hope of helping other young kids in similar situations. Arsha Gaur is a student in New Delhi. She is a passionate debater and writer, and has written 21 articles as a teenage consultant for the Daily O. Gaur was invited to the India Today conclave in Mumbai in 2019, along with Dr. Shelja Sen. to give a personal account of her battle with anorexia and depression since then she's found read together a website that uses multimedia technology to aid and enhance the experience of children who struggle with reading or have learning disabilities shelja sen is a narrative therapist writer and co-founder of children first institute of child and adolescent mental health She is also an international faculty at Dalmit Center, Australia. She is just a TED speaker and a columnist with Indian Express. And her latest book is "Reclaim Your Life." Please do remember to ask questions and comment by using by typing it into the comment section. Ladies and gentlemen, Age of Disquiet, Reclaiming Hope, Sonali Gupta, Kerevi Bharatram, and Arshya Gaur. in conversation with shelja sen over to you shelja thank you so much arupa uh thank you jlf for arranging this panel on mental health um i think what i love most about jlf every year is the vibrant energy so i'm going to ask you a quirky you know i have a quirky request i would say before we start and that is i would like you to visualize that we are not right now sitting in front of our screens but we are sitting in the lawns of diggy palace there are you know pulsating energy vibrant colors lovely sun glorious sun and we're sitting in the sun and doing what we humans love doing telling the stories of our life uh so i'm going to start with by sharing something that i'm so excited about is having two young writers here arsha gaur and kervi bharatram because and they share their lived experience with the mental health struggles and i'm sure sonali will agree with me that we cannot have discussion on mental health unless we have young voices adding their rich refreshing and unique experiences like the saying goes nothing about us without us so i'm so glad jlf has uh, invited two young speakers in this panel 
Um, I'm going to start. I'm not going to waste any time because I'm really, really keen to have this conversation. I'm going to start with you, Arsha. Uh, you know, I want to check with you if you have your book with you, which is your favorite poem and uh, what about that poem is so meaningful for you? So my favorite poem in the book is definitely the first poem, which is called History. And it's the first poem for a reason, because it was the first poem I wrote about my journey. So it holds a special place in my heart. Yes. So um, personally, I feel that this poem was able to encapsulate what I thought others perceived of me when I was going through this journey. It has the, the juxtaposition of the past and the present and that dimension of longing of me being my vibrant and um, joyful self that I was before I fell prey to depression. In this way, I think it marked the beginning of the end in the sense that it was the first time I expressed that I wanted to be a survivor. And hence I wrote these lines that not a mountain too big to climb or a task that she cannot achieve. There will come a time where she will rise, she will succeed. Wow, beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. And if I can have the privilege of, uh, you know, sharing a couple of lines from there, but like raindrops, drip tears like a stagnant puddle those eyes are filled mute she is her voice and i'm thinking here you are in your strong voice you know once mute and now lending this very strong voice and uh, this voice which is going to help so many people talk about you know their mental health struggles so thank you for sharing that um i you know arsha my favorite poem if i can say is starlight yeah, I love that poem and I think the illustration that goes with it. Uh, it reads like, at night when everyone is asleep, I secretly peek through my window pane. At the sky that seems so far away, it seems dark and dreary. In my room alone, I find myself prayed at. I close my eyes to keep the fear at bay, but there's a beam of light that keeps me from looking away. My eyes reveal themselves slowly. I look at the stars. The sky feels a little less dark. It's, it just gives me goosebumps just, you know, reading it. And, you know, what I was most curious about, Arsha, is you use this word prayed. Yeah, prayed upon, prayed at. Yes. Uh, this, and this visual of this young girl sitting at the window being prayed at, P-R-E-Y-E-D, for people who don't have the poem in front of you. And it stayed with me, the image of this young woman being watched. Like it's almost like the gaze being watched, being judged, being evaluated. And that's the image I had. I wonder if you can explain to us what you had in mind when you wrote that. I think society can sometimes be very critical of people, especially people who are very different in the sense of uh, physiologically, mentally or emotionally. And the first time that I felt this gaze or this praying was when um, I was younger and my relatives or friends would playfully, you know, um, comment on my body by calling Motu or Chotu. And I think that's the thing with Asian cultures. We often make nicknames with um, physiological attributes. And I obviously did not take it playfully. And I think um, it, it, it talks about the fact that this praying or this gaze makes you question if I'm, if I'm always being looked at. What am I wearing? What am I eating? How do I look? And uh, it, it it says a lot about how how unsafe we can feel in society, and yet uh, you know be inside our homes and yet feel unsafe. This praying gaze makes you question um, your values or maybe how you look. And I think this obsession with looks or diet or health today has ironically gone to a point where it's all become very unhealthy. And I think my insecurity and uh, and the comment on the world today regarding health is what was the inspiration behind my poem. Thank you, Arsha. And uh, with this, I would like to um, bring in Kervi. Kervi, um, you know what Arsha was talking about that <clears throat> children from very young age, they are being evaluated, right? They're being judged. And uh, I always have this image when I see little children, when they have no sense of that gaze of being evaluated and judged and they are free and spontaneous. And, you know, that's why I love working with children. And some way they start losing that. Some way they start losing that and this whole judgment in the evaluation starts coming in. Um, 
And I, I wonder because I wonder what you would say, because I know this is something that you have talked about. This is something you've written about. And uh, what would you say about this constant gaze that follows young women? Um, I think that especially when they're younger people who are suffering through mental health, it's not taken as seriously. And because their peers don't understand it either, um, I think that is the biggest struggle. And um, I started struggling. My journey with depression started when I was around 17. So young, still older than Arshia, but young. And uh, my peers didn't know anything. And when you're a kid, it's just assumed that, you know, you don't have any problems. You're not financially responsible you don't your if your parents are together if you don't have any major struggles at home you don't deserve to have depression or you don't have any reason which is worthy of being depressed and i think that that makes you insecure and makes you question that why am i like this when there's nothing wrong with me and uh, that's personally also one of the reasons why I wrote my book was to explain to other children around the person who's going through what they're going through and kind of transport them into that child's world who's struggling with all of this to understand that it's not in their hands. They didn't choose to be this way and um, kind of transport them and even the parent to transport them into that world so they understand what that child is going through and that it's something that happened to them, something that they, it was not to do with what was happening around them and not to do with any particular interaction or um, environmental cause. Right. And, uh, you know, thank you for uh, sharing that, Kerry. And, um, you know, how much I love your book and I have, uh, you know, in my, the blurb at the back, I've written that there's a powerful combination of rhymes and illustrations that can fill you with awe and make you cry, but leave you with a lighter heart and sheer joy. And, uh, you know, this particular, I'm going to read out my favorite lines from the book where uh, you're talking about radio. And when you talk about radio, you talk about depression, basically, the radio of depression. Or it feels like there's a radio going on in your head, spouting negative commentary about everything being said. When you try to talk to someone, it says you're boring, no fun. When you try and step out of your room, it says go back, run. Or when you have dreams and aspirations, it says you can't, you don't deserve it. It is going on in your head like a chant. It's like a bad dream, you're really out of luck. And every night thereafter in the same dream, you're stuck. Even after a nightmare, you wake up, you're okay. But this just doesn't stop. It happens every day. And this, you know, again, like when I was reading Arsha's poem, this gives me goosebumps and, you know, it gives me chills because this is the reality for people, right? When they're stuck with the, the constant chant of depression, go away, you're no good, you're worthless, there's no hope, you know, you're all alone, run away. And this, this and how this constant loop people get stuck in, uh, and there's still so much of silence, there's so much of shame, there's so much of stigma around it, and people don't understand what people are going through, right? Uh, I want to understand from you, what are some of the things that you have in your journey when uh, you were struggling with depression? What are some of the things that you came across? Uh, some, it could be common, you know, kind of some kind of myths or some way of understanding mental health that really didn't work for you, which you're like, you know, like some people talk about, just snap out of it. I mean, I wonder what kind of things did you come across, which, you know, you're like, this doesn't really work for me. Um, I think, like I mentioned, the assumption that you have to have something really wrong going on in your life to be depressed. That was what I struggled with the most because other people thought like that. And then in turn, even I thought that, you know, I'm, this is happening to me because I'm weak, not because there's a chemical imbalance or it's something that I'm struggling with. And I think when you're in depression, you almost don't believe that you have depression and it's something that's wrong with you and not a disease or an illness. So that's the biggest struggle. And like you said, um, 
you when we were in therapy together you used to always try and make me separated from myself which is what i struggled with for the longest time and that's where these metaphors came in where you and i would discuss and try and think of it as a third party and not something internally so instead of saying that uh my mind is telling me this we'd say the radio has come on mm-hmm. or um uh, instead of saying i'm getting worse it's to say i'm falling further down the hole and slowly slowly in thinking this way we started i started separating it from myself and that's what i wanted to do for other people and i think that you know whatever it is that you, you struggle with when you go mental health your problems yourself you realize that um it's very different from what you've heard what you've seen and um the experience is very personal so what i've been through what arshi has been through what anybody else has been through it can never be the same and the only thing that ties it together is metaphors because it can be taken in the way that you want it to or the way you experienced it mm-hmm. and uh that was kind of what i wanted to break so whatever perception there was of mental health these metaphors fit into everybody's story and journey I love the metaphors in your book. I mean the the metaphors throughout, right? Everything is a you know whatever you're talking about uh, it's it's been the hope or it's talking about depression, it's talking about friendships. Everything is done through metaphors. And metaphors yeah, you're right, they're so powerful and they're so visual. Um so now if I can bring you in here and um I'm going to take a slightly different angle with you, you know, Arsha and um uh, uh can we have shared their journey in mental health some of the struggles they had what helped them i i'm i'm very curious well while reading your book you know i loved your book uh, anxiety uh, overcome it and live without fear uh what i loved about your book is that you brought in a uh, very uh you know the the latest lingo the latest language around mental health struggles and all Uh, one thing i mean keeping in mind that you know we are still going through a pandemic the uh, one thing that uh, you uh, talk about is product- productivity guilt and this is something that's been talked about so often everybody's you know there's a lot of talk about productivity guilt i'd love to hear your views on it you're mute sonali you'll have to unmute yourself yes can you hear me now yeah 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 i think my internet is a little patchy and i am anxious myself as this happens uh, i think coming back to i think you know i wrote the book in 2019 and i think you know much before the pandemic happened productivity guilt was still so huge whether it was you know gen z millennials and you know one of the simplest way it would show up would be on a weekend where you know people would say you know there's so much to watch there's so much to read and i feel i've not done anything in spite of them working 10 12 hours you know in the you know on a daily basis and i think now with the pandemic it has taken a new form where pandemic productivity where you know we feel that we amidst a pandemic we need to prove how much we are capable of doing and i think since then so to push you out to the world to your capable of generating more and more and it seems like we have moved can you hear uh, your voice is breaking maybe you could switch off your video and just keep the audio uh, on hello hello ha uh, sonali sonali we can hear you please just continue maybe you need to switch off the video the video is off please continue yeah continue maybe we've lost her for a while i think we've lost her for a while but i'll i'll go back yes yeah you know there yeah. you are so yes i continue i don't know till where you heard me because i kept talking and then no, no, you were just talking about during the pandemic the pressures become more yeah i think during the press during the pandemic i think in march it started with this feeling that we have to maintain the status quo and it has become far more and i think this productivity guilt comes from the sense of being on the doing mode versus the being mode and i think even at this point we need to figure how can we pause take a step back and move into the being mode versus the doing mode at this stage 
Yeah. You know, that's very interesting. I, I, what I love about my work is I think I'm a curator of the know-how of the young people I work with the, in, you know, the lived experience, the know-how, the knowledges of young people. And this young uh, person, young man I was talking to, and he said, um, you know, the, he was talking about productivity, guilt, and said there's a, there's a paradox, you know, that uh, why is it that during the pandemic, there is more level of, you know, higher level of anxiety and the guilt around it. And uh, according to him, very interesting, he said that earlier, if there was, uh, you know, difficult times, a crisis, like a war, everybody would be out fighting. But what happens if the enemy is uh, invisible? It's all around us. It's like the polluted air around us. We, we can't. So what do we do? We internalize it. We take it upon us and we pressurize ourselves, we push ourselves. We and society also expects that. And I found this, uh, this paradox really, really interesting way to look at it. Absolutely. And I think also this is a perennial one, right? When it started in March, it seemed like it would stop by June, July, right? A lot of us thought it would pause. Yeah. So I think like the stress adaptation syndrome, the general adaptation syndrome, our adrenaline got kicked in and it still kicked in. And I think, you know, we have lost those water cooler conversations. We have lost the ability to have those small connections, right? If this were to happen in life, I wouldn't be worried about technology. We would be doing this shell giant person. And we have lost those precious moments that allow you to be. You know, a client of mine mentioned that, you know, on some days I continue working very hard because there is nowhere to go. So work has become also a refuge, a way to seek your self-esteem only comes out of work. Yeah. That's so true. That as it, that's the only way we can prove our worthiness. Yeah. And that's really sad. And I think, and that's, you know, that is a, you know, that would trigger more and more anxiety, right? Because it works really well for an organizational culture for employees to keep churning work at the end of the day. Yeah. That's, that's true. Um, I'm going to go to, I think it's very much, uh, you know, I would really like to uh, get some young perspective on it. So Arsha, I have a question for you. You know, in, um, in uh, narrative uh, therapy, we have a principle. We, you know, it is uh, the person is not the problem. The problem is the problem and the problem is social. We believe uh, that many times these problems, uh, depression, anxiety, eating disorders, anorexia are located in the person, but actually many times it's to do with the society. You know, like I like to say, it's not our children that are broken, it's a society that's broken, right? I would love to understand your perspective on this, what uh, Sonali was talking about right now, this, this pressure from our society, especially on young people, this idea of success, a one idea of success in a rat race, I'd love to understand your views on it. I think we've had many conversations about the rat race, about having that feeling of always being part of the race that everyone's being part of, whether or not, you know, whether it whether or not it agrees with your values or your belief systems, but because everybody doing is doing it, it makes it right. And I think that's that's with everything, whether it, it starts in school where like, you know, there's peer pressure and you're coerced into being a certain way otherwise you're the other you're the inferior and then you come into the corporate sector if you see someone else is working a lot you feel like oh I should be working a lot and if you're not working a lot then you're the other over there so I think the what society establishes as the ideal and the other is what makes one feel inferior when at the end of the day I think what people really want is acceptance we feel like we feel that society has come a long way to accommodating diversity. And yes, we have. But I feel like it is the simple things that we say to each other or the simple things like using the word normal. I think when people use the word normal, they don't realize how different people can actually feel, how out of place people can actually feel when, when the word normal is made to make pe people feel equal. And I think it is the simple things like this that make people cast doubt on themselves that make them internalize things and I think like everyone else on this panel has said there is a need to not internalize things and talk about it because when someone is given that education and that assurance that you are not alone you become less susceptible to falling prey to depression or other or uh, you know other mental health difficulties 
And that's the thing, right, Arsha, that, you know, so beautifully you explained it, that, uh, you know, this this pressure to be part of this one way of being, one way of success, uh, and how acceptance is so important. And, uh, you know, my understanding sometimes is, I mean, I have shared very openly in my book, and I, you know, talked about it, my struggle with depression many years ago. And what I see is in my work when we, uh, you know, the the work that I do collaboratively with the young people I work with, that typically depression or mental health struggles have a tendency to make conclusions or is a, has a very convincing voice, yeah? Has a convincing voice, makes you end up having conclusions about your worthiness, about your identity, about who you are, or about your future, there's no future for you, or even about in terms of, uh, you know, about your relationships, it tends to isolate people like you were saying, Arsha. Can we, I know um, this is something that, you know, we've had conversations on in the past and I would love to understand, you know, I, I'm because you love metaphors, so I'm going to share a metaphor with you. You know, like I said, I love collecting metaphors and things from people. There's this young person I was talking to and uh, he said, uh, you know, that our idea in our society, our idea of success is this highway that you set your GPS, there's a beginning, there's an end, and highways to it. But what if you don't want to be part of that highway? Suppose you want to take the lanes of life, which are quirky, which are full of, you know, you make mistakes, you have failures, you hit uh, roadblocks, but that's okay. You're living your life, your lane, in your lane, rather than taking a highway, not reaching somewhere, but just enjoying the process. So uh, I know this is, this is something that you, what do you think about it? Of just not I think a highway a, mentality, highway approach to life, but a lean approach to life. So I think no matter how aware you are, there's this fear of falling behind. And I had to take two gap years out of school because of depression. And I felt like all my friends, everybody I knew was taking steps forward and I was taking steps back. And that, you know, the gap was going to become too big and I was falling behind. And then eventually when I went to college, I expected everybody who was joining that class to be two years younger than me. And, you know, I was going to be so out of place. I was going to be the other. And I realized that more than half the class had taken a detour on that highway and had reached and had, you know, had to drop out of college because of something they were going through and were restarting or had to go through sim similar things as me. And I realized that, you know, you don't know what's going on behind somebody else's um, front. And like Arshia mentioned, normal. My personal favorite line from my book is that you may never be normal like the next guy in line, but is anyone really normal? Is anyone really fine? And that's what just made me realize that that highway is something we've made up in our minds and there is no right path to take. And, you know, you may not even, you may take different paths and land up at the same destination. You may not even land up at the same destination. And why would you want to? Why would you want to all be at the same place? Why would you not want to be different? Yeah, thank you so much. That was so beautifully explained. Uh, so Nali, um, if it's okay with you, I'm going to read out, you know, it from your foreword, uh, some lines by Jerry Pinto. And I yeah. love him so much, uh, you know, which connects very much with uh, what you were talking about, what Arsha was talking about, what Kervi was talking about. And he says, but sometimes it's just the feeling that you're not doing it right, that you're not maximizing your life, that's it's all passing you by. All around you, your friends seem to be leading great lives. Everyone you know has moved to Goa. And they all live in a big house with a bal chow and a luscious garden. Or they are all on vacation with the sea glittering behind like an accomplished extra. And you look up from the little screen of your phone and your life is a sad mess. And the anxiety begins. Why is my life not like theirs? you know, what othering we talked about. And, you know, this, this is such beautiful lines and I think they encapsulate the experiences everybody. I mean, I'm talking about young people, but I think everybody has in the impact of social media on uh, where everybody else, the othering, everybody else is fine except my life, right? Everybody puts their perfect pictures, perfect lives on social media. Um, and I know in your book, you talk a, a lot about uh, what would, can you share the impact of social media that you've seen in your practice? 
yes absolutely i think you know what uh, what all of you have been talking about you know i call it death by social comparison right on a daily basis we are comparing our lives on a minute by minute basis to others to what are curated 10 second experiences that others have put and i think also it you know i don't think we live in a time where we have a choice about whether we do technology or not you know we do social media or not i think it's about how do we do it and i think um, you know i think it has come to a point where people have begin to use social media yeah to also soothe themselves to also compare what's happening in their life and also reach conclusions about other people and i think social media sometimes can be a thinking trap in itself right it can just play games with your mind and i think you know as you rightly said whether it's gen z whether it's millennials whether it's people in their 50s you know they would have conversations about everybody you know during the pandemic seems to have now started traveling i'm the only one not traveling uh, you know i remember early into the pandemic uh, you know i think during the lockdown in my area for the first week the butter butter was not available and i remember seeing somebody doing barbecue at home and i'm like how can they do barbecue at home when i don't even have butter they have you know there are so many things and i think it has become such a part of us where all of us are guilty of looking at others life and comparing and i think it has become an itch and i think it has also started managing our life and the idea is how do we manage that distance and what happens to the inner critic that comes in so you know i often feel you put go on to social media and your inner critic just comes alive you know in those moments and i think the idea is to manage one inner critic and you know coming to what you were saying i think whether it's the highway or the lanes of life i think the idea is we need to have a choice to move between both of them and i think another problem linking to social media is people feel if they put something out there it's going to stay for there forever and it doesn't give them choice at all and i find that very very limiting mm thank you so much sonali i'm sure i'm going to come to uh, you know and i'm sure it'll come up in the question and answers some uh, suggestions you might have for the self critic that is constantly nagging at uh, each one absolutely yeah uh, and just before we round up i'm going to ask you arshia what advice would you have for 13 year old arshia now looking back now you're 16 what advice what would you tell 13 year old arshia if you could go back I think I would have a long list of things to tell little Arshia, but in a nutshell, I would I would tell her to take pride in herself and not shy away from who she is. I would tell her to not tell, uh, to not let anyone tell her otherwise, and not and always run her race. To not be afraid of what others were doing, and just do things that she believed that she was that she believed in, and that she held to be in high regard. And on a lighter note, I would tell her to enjoy more pizza and ice cream with her parents and her friends. <laughs> love that can we what would you say to parents because there might be some parents who might be listening and parents who are concerned about their young people the children what would you tell the parents uh, yeah i think i tell the parents the same thing that i would tell the kid because the parent is going through something very similar when their child is struggling and i would tell them that hang in there um just the way things randomly changed and suddenly all your lives were different and became darker and it seemed like it was never going to end just that it will change again and if you hang in there long enough the change will happen and to help your kid just try and understand don't try your solutions because when you are kind of give solutions and they're not working it's a lot more frustrating just be there listen to their struggles and try and hold their hand through it and uh, yeah don't have too many expectations from them that they're not able to fulfill because then they're going to start putting up a front in front of you also and that's not going to help either of you if you don't know what's going on with them beautiful thank you so much i think with this we're going to open up for question and answers i'm sure there are lots of questions that i'm going to start taking on there are many many questions um okay so uh, this is a question uh from uh, a, a 
viewer, I have bipolar disorder and it's not uncommon for me to hear the stigma surrounding it. How do you think one should react to people who are not trauma informed? This question I'm going to pass on to Sonali. Uh, you mute Sonali. Oh. Yes, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. Much. yeah, yeah. Thank you for sharing, you know, and, you know, your vulnerability here to begin with. And I think, um, I think the first step would be you, you are aware that they are not trauma informed to begin with. So I think you're already beginning it with a sense of awareness there. And I think a good idea is to begin by telling them what it feels like, what's it like to lead your life on a daily basis and to build a dialogue around it. I think the important idea is that when we talk to people, you know, whether someone with a lived experience or professional, so even if others are defensive, for us to not begin from a place of defensiveness. And I think you asking this itself indicates that you have openness and acceptance. So, you know, I think you already are in a space, you know, where you would share it. And at the same time, talk about it as, you know, it's a non-linear process, right? Healing is a non-linear process. And to talk about the journey with its up and down and the moments, you know, where you feel that, you know, share your experience with your vulnerability and make it a dialogue, allow them to have a conversation around it. Does that answer, Sherja, what you had in mind? He or she? There's one question that, uh, you know, along with it, how do you think one should react to people who are not trauma-informed? And I'm so, wondering if the person means in terms of the person uh, says things which evokes very strong experiences or might almost re-traumatize the person. Uh, what can, how can, uh, you know, if you can't avoid a person like that, how do you interact with somebody like that? I think it would be okay, you know, if it's triggering you or if a word is used which you think is not appropriate or is particularly triggering, I think it would be a good idea to let someone know about it. We can be firm with gen we can be firm and gentle. We can also be assertive and still be compassionate in our narrative. So it may be okay to tell people, like, you know, when people use words or when, as you rightly said, when somebody says just snap out of it, it may be okay to say that that's not an option on so many days. And I understand where you are coming from, but this may not be an option, and this is what it feels like how all consuming it is. So I think when people are not trauma informed, the idea is to respond versus react. Because I see a lot of people who are not trauma informed as places where we can build awareness. So I see it as a tiny, you know, sliding door moment to create awareness, just like, you know, how I think Jaipur Lit having this, you know, conversation is that sliding door moment for mental health, right? Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, uh, to what extent do positive affirmations uh, help a person in recovering from their mental deterioration? Um, and I would uh, put this question across to Arsha. Positive affirmations. I know, Arsha, this is something that you shared that um, talking to self is something that has helped you. So I wonder if something you would like to share here. Um, yes, we've talk, talked extensively about self-coaching. Mm -hmm. uh, I think speaking to yourself and like I think Kervi also mentioned, to see it in a, from a third party perspective. And in that sense, I think it helps you to get a more holistic um, uh, idea of uh, yourself. And in that sense, I feel people should, uh, uh, apart from talking to themselves and coaching themselves, I think it is also important to have family or people who surround you and um, give you that same love and compassion. So along with that individual self-affirmation, you also get affirmation from society or from the people that matter to you the most. Because I think at the end of the day, what all we, we desire and what, what keeps human beings going is their strong and supportive relationships. So I think apart from um, positive affirmations for oneself that makes that's help, that helps one believe in oneself, it is also important to be surrounded by positivity. Thank you, Asha. Kervi, would you like to add something here? Because I know there's another metaphor that we've used sometime is echo chamber. How an echo chamber, we suppose that, you know, the voice of depression can create an echo chamber. And 
affirmations can make a break of that echo chamber would you agree with that i would agree for me a personal dialogue has always been toxic because of the nature of the disease but what helped me the most is people around me giving this positive affirmations and that breaks that echo chamber because there's it's countering the things that the echo chamber is constantly telling you and that's stuck in your brain so when somebody is giving you an opposite viewpoint it breaks that um thought process and it's very important i think that people around you give you positive affirmations without it being too preachy and that you know you should be feeling this way it's like you are like this and i hope you can see it this way great thank you kervi uh some questions i'm skipping because we've already discussed them in our conversation um uh, so there's a question while there is a stigma around mental health conversely there is a social media wave of toxic positivity and denial how would you say we need to find a balance between talking about it but not taking the social media toxic view on it tokenistic view on it uh, kervi i'm going to start with you and then check with others i think it's a very important uh, we have recently discussed this and i am i mean very deep in the whole social media world because i run a makeup blog and i decided to to take a more open stand on it and started talking about my mental health on social media and i thought what i'd be doing with that would be being more open and not showing that 10 second trailer and just the good things in my life but also showing the negative and the reality but what happened was and what i realized was with that over talking about mental health also has its own negatives and um ev- because everyone's experience is so different when you share yours again that a uh, comparison comes in and it's like i don't feel this way and uh, you even with talking about mental health you're trying to show the positives by saying that this is what i do for self care and i've had a low day but i've come out with it by doing this and you're kind of still trying to show the best in your life through the struggles you're going through and it's become almost cool that you know i'm struggling with this i'm struggling with that and i think that there's this like double edged sword with social media and being open about mental health and there needs to be like a middle way where it's not like this cult cool thing that you know even i have depression even i have anxiety and you're missing you're the other now if you don't have something like this so it's um uh, it's a blurry line i feel yeah thank you arsha would you like to add anything Yes I think um, that has a, uh, I think this plays a huge role in trivializing uh, mental health difficulties as well because once um, there's a difference between glamorization and sensitization and I feel like often we can blur the lines between the two and when that happens I think it just makes it more easy to trivialize these things and not take them seriously and that's when I think society also starts using words like uh, anxiety or depression so loosely So yes definitely there needs to be a line we draw between the sensitization and glamorization of mental health difficulties. Thank you Arsha. Uh, so now I want to you know in Instagram sometimes I feel everybody's a Instagram therapist you know the kind of therapists we come across. I wonder what you have to say about this tokenistic view on everybody being a therapist on Instagram. Yeah I think couple of things I think I wrote an article about how we live in the age of hashtag mental health you know and it's worrisome that you know mental health has been reduced to a hashtag I think while it began from a narrative of creating awareness I think the important idea is to figure what are your sources of information one second you know I think as already it has been spoken about I think the, the mental health conditions are very subjective very nuanced and I think it's important to understand when we are diluting them sometimes you know on social media mm-hmm. and I think that's an important understanding that we need to keep in mind and I think I think more and more the information you know when people ask me what what are the sources of 
information. I think sometimes the idea is to choose more credible sources of information when you're talking about illness. It's also, I think, important. I think what happens with social media is the minute someone shares their vulnerability, everybody tries and figures out how is it similar to theirs. The reality is two people could be struggling with anxiety and depression. And I'm sure everyone on this panel would say, and it feels completely different and it's still authentic and it's still a reflection of their own vulnerability. And I think it's important to remember that. And I think we have a tricky road ahead where we need to also become mindful. I think mental health requires, the language around mental health requires more mindfulness on social media on a daily basis. Yeah, thank you so much, Sonali. I think with this, I would like to uh, wrap up our conversation. Such amazing, such wonderful conversation uh, we've had today on, uh, you know, hearing young people's voice. And I think end of the day, what we're talking about is this whole this othering and the stigma and the normalization and uh, you know that whole idea of normal and how important it is for young people to have a sense of inviting their sense of agency purpose and connection and end of the day it's a message is if a parents if your parents are there i see you i hear you and i have your back and that's all the young people need to know right thank you so much uh, arshia kervi and sonali and I think this conversation has really helped us to reclaim hope. Over to you, Sharupa. Thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, you know, I can't even share in words how I think all of us have felt hearing all of you speak on a topic that, you know, it's not easy to talk about. And thank you for your empathy, sympathy, and sharing so openly. Thank you, really, from all of us. Thank you. You stay logged on. And thank you you to watch with us the series of exciting sessions that we have specially curated for you this is the weekend so each and every session is really remarkable please stay tuned in thank you the jaipur literature festival is protected by detol समाज अपनी भाषा में ही आता है कंटेंट आपकी भाषा में ओनली ऑन डेली हंट हमें पता है आपको क्या चाहिए अपनी पसंद का कंटेंट ओनली ऑन डेली हंट रखो अपने एरिया की खबर लोकल अपडेट्स ओनली ऑन डेली हंट टू ऑल स्टोरी टेलर्स एंड स्टोरी लवर्स माई नेम इज लक्ष दाता आई होस्ट एंड प्रोड्यूस द जयपुर बाइट्स पॉडकास्ट वेर यू कैन हियर मेनी ऑफ द अमेजिंग सेशन फ्रॉम द जयपुर लिटरेचर फेस्टिवल आई ऑल्सो प्रोड्यूस अ फ्यू अदर पॉडकास्ट एज यू कैन सी राइट हियर इंग्लिश हिंदी फिक्शन नॉन फिक्शन इफ यू सी समथिंग यू लाइक मे बी यू कैन टेक ए स्क्रीन शॉट ऑफ दिस राइट नाउ I'll give you a second and tune in later. Find them on your favorite podcast app.